your Bibles, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2 today. And we're going to jump right into our message this morning. As Matt has already mentioned, the message today is entitled, Live Holy. Uh, if you have not got a worship guide today, let me encourage you to just slip your hand up. Miss Carol will get you a worship guide. Also, inside your worship guide, there is a note sheet. And that will be especially helpful today. I, I really believe God has a word for us this morning. And you'll see that note sheet inside your worship guide. I encourage you to take advantage of that. Follow along. And I think what will happen is you'll be able to take this home with you this week and think through this and study over this and pray that God will help you to make the application that you need to make. And so take advantage of those study resources uh, today. I encourage you, encourage you to do that. I know you've already heard this joke, and so I, I hesitate to tell it. But for those of you who have been, uh, who uh, follow me on Facebook, you know that there's been somewhat of an outcry in recent hours about the length of my sermon. <laughs> and I want you to know I take great offense to that. <laughs> um, my dad posted a comment on my Facebook uh, post yesterday about, uh, hey, but I hope you brought your lunch with you. Uh, you know, it's going to be a long message. And it made me think, I know you've probably heard this, but I heard about a pastor. He was just notorious for being long-winded. And one day he was preaching away, and an hour passed, hour and 15, hour and a half, he's still preaching. You could tell, man, people were just restless and they were ready to go. And finally this guy gets up and starts to walk out. And the pastor took offense to that. He's like, hey, where, where are you going, man? And the guy said, I'm going to get a haircut. And he said, well, why didn't you get a haircut before you came? He said, I didn't need one before I came. <laughs> so, anyways, I hope you uh, hope you didn't come today with that mentality. I'm not going to be that long, all right? But uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 in your Bibles this morning. How many are happy in Jesus today? Amen. Amen. Hey, you know what the Bible says? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And uh, we ought to be cheerful. That's one of the things I love about that psalm that Matt read just a little bit ago. Uh, just the idea of joy and happiness. And, you know, if we're trusting in Jesus today, we got something to be happy about. Yes, you know? I believe God's people ought to be the, the happiest people on the planet. Do you believe yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Man, we, we are not looking for hope. We have hope in Jesus. And so let's just be happy in that today. And let's rejoice in our Lord. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I want you to look down at verse number 9 uh, in your Bibles today. And let's open our hearts to what God has for us. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9, For ye remember, brethren, our labor... And travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in you that believe. I want to open this message this morning by sharing a quote from Matthew Henry. Matthew, it's on the back of your notes, by the way. The Bible, or Matthew Henry, rather. This is what Matthew Henry had to say. He said, Our great gospel privilege is that God has called us to His kingdom and glory. The great gospel duty is that we walk worthy of God. We should live as becomes those called with such a high and holy calling. Our great business is to honor, serve, and please God Amen. and to seek Him, uh, and to seek to be worthy of Him. Amen. As we've learned in the past uh, two weeks in our series, Pleasing God, Paul, along with his partners in ministry, Silas and Timothy, had really one primary goal in life, and it's the same goal that we should all have. And it's very simple. It is a goal to please God. I, I believe as I studied these words, and as I've just read many times in this passage of Scripture, we, we see men whose primary motivation for everything that they did, every message that they preached, Every time they shared the gospel, every struggle that they endured was done with a heart to please God. Over the past two weeks, we looked to 1 Thessalonians 2 to see a pattern of a life lived to please God. I want you to notice that, as we've already learned, but just in, by way of review, that Paul and Timothy and Silas made the decision to live loud. We see that in verse number 4 of chapter 2. They said, but as we were allowed God to be put in trust with the gospel, here it is, even so we speak. In spite of the shame, in spite of the, sh the struggle, Paul, Silas, and Timothy made the decision 
to uh, live loud, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got a little bit of a hum going on in our some kind of a ring going on in the system. If you can turn me down just a little bit, that way it's not a distraction. Not only did they decide to live loud to please God, but number two, we see that uh, they decided to live for others. That's better. Look at verse number seven, if you would. The Bible says, Paul says, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also of our own souls, because ye were dear to us. Paul and Silas and Timothy had learned that the key to joy in life was Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. You see, Paul and Silas and Timothy refused to follow the trend of the day. They refused to speak flattering words to people. They refused to hide their true intentions. They rather chose to speak the truth. They chose to sacrifice. They chose to do without. They chose to provide for their own needs so as not to be a burden to the Thessalonians. Finally, we saw in last week's message that Paul and his team engaged in ministry that was similar to that of a sacrificial mother who selflessly cares for her children. You see it in the verse there. He describes their ministry as being gentle and cherishing and affectionate and willing and imparting. And that's the proper context for where we're going to pick up our message today. Number one, we see a call to remember. A call uh, to remember. You see it there in verse number 9, if you look at the very first part of the verse, in verse number 9, Paul says, for ye remember. Uh, the word remember obviously just means to, to call to mind. To call to mind. Uh, we all have had things happen in our life that are significant events that we can all remember just immediately. Maybe it was uh, when you, the day you got married. Or maybe it was the day you met the love of your life. Or maybe it was the day that one of your children was born into the world. And man, that is a day that sticks out to you. Or maybe it was a, a big move that you moved like we did from North Carolina to California. We'll never forget that. That was a, a, a monumental moment in our life that's easy to remember. Or maybe that you purchased a house or purchased a car. These are things that happen in life that really uh, are memorable. But how many of you know there are things that happen each and every week and each and every day uh, the day-to-day -day recurring mundane things that happen in our life that don't seem significant enough to store within our minds. Well, Paul here challenges them to call to their memory the ministry that he and his team had engaged in in Thessalonica. Essentially, Paul says, hey, do you remember when? Uh, do you remember the way in which we uh, minister to you? Paul says, I, I want to stir up your mind to remember some things about our ministry that was very, very important. Paul, what do you want us to remember? Well, here it is. Number one, letter A, remember our work. Remember our work. You see the verse in your Bible there on the screen, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse number 9. He says, For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail. And then he uses that word again. For laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. As I've studied this text, I think there's one thing that really jumps off the page to me concerning the ministry of Paul and Silas and Timothy. If I could characterize the, the ministry of these men, I would boil it down to one word, and that's the word humility. Humility. We were talking this morning, uh, we, we had the privilege on Tuesday night of hosting uh, Bruce Bright, who's a former country music artist. And man, we had a great time. For those of you who were here, thank you for coming. And we had a really great time together. But the one thing that really stu stu uh, stuck out to me, or stood out to me, about Bruce Bright is the fact that this is a guy who used to stand on the stage, who used to be in the spotlight, who a lot of people knew his name. And here was a man who was full of humility. In fact, he even made that, that remark on Tuesday night that, you know what, it's, he said, I don't really care if anybody knows my name. I want the name of Jesus to be known. Amen. I think the Apostle Paul had that same mentality. In fact, I want you to notice that one of the words in the text that we see is the word brethren. He says, ye remember brethren. We would say brothers. Uh, yes, Paul was their spiritual mother, so to speak. It was uh, in that he had men mentored them and Paul had cared for them as little children. Yes, as we'll see in just a moment, Paul that was like a spiritual father to them in that he served as an authority figure in their lives, challenging them forward for Christ. But in reality, do you know who Paul and Silas and Timothy really were? They were brothers. They were brothers. They were equals with the Thessalonians. 
They were brothers in Christ who shared the same heavenly Father. You know what we can do well to learn from that example? Sometimes we get a little bit too big for our britches. Anybody know what that means? You know what I'm talking about this morning? Uh, we think we're really better than we are, but you know who we all are? We're sinners in need of a Savior, and if we've been saved, we're all the children of God. Amen. In fact, the Bible says in Galatians 3, 26-28, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You know what that tells me, Brother Joe? That tells me that I can't get up on the platform and say, Hey, guess what I did to become in Christ Jesus? I got baptized. I passed out of the gospel tracts. I donated enough money to the church. Everybody look at me. No. You're in Christ by faith. Uh, you are the children of God by faith. There is nothing that you can do to earn your salvation. There's nothing that you can do to earn the, the fatherhood of God, the adoption that we enjoy in Christ. He says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul understood who he used to be. He used to be a sinner who needed grace just like the Thessalonians did in spite of his authority as a, an apostle despite his authority as a mentor to new believers he never forgot that he was serving under the authority of God his heavenly father Amen. you know what I'm nothing special this morning you know what we are today we're brothers in Christ we're sisters uh, we are uh, we are brothers and sisters in Christ this morning but not only that, I, I see humility in that, but I also see humility in what he refers to here as, as labor and travail. I'm going to put it back up on the screen there for you to see it. He says, you remember, brethren, our labor and travail. I want to point out the word labor. It, it, it means to beat down with weariness. That's what it is defined as. To, to beat down uh, with weariness. Have you ever worked so hard one day that you got home and you just felt beat down? Does anybody relate to that? I've been there. I was thinking about one time in particular. Maybe some of you walked in here thinking, man, I feel beat down this morning, Pastor. Um, I remember one time in particular when we lived in North Carolina, we had to replace the roof on our home. And, and we didn't really have the money to do it. But I knew a guy in our church. His name is Mike Lester. And he used to do roofing. And I, I got with him. I said, brother, we got some leaks happening in the house. And it's getting pretty bad. And, and we're going to have to replace the roof. And he came over and he looked at it. And, and he said, yeah, we can, we can buy the materials, me and you. And another guy can jump on it and knock it out in two or three days. And he told me the price. And I thought, man, that is a great price. And we can do that. He said, now I'm going to tell you something. He said, replacing a roof is not for the faint of heart. Especially in the North Carolina humidity and the North Carolina heat. He said, I'm telling you, this will be the hardest work you've ever done. You know, I was like, oh, it'll be fine. I have no problem. I've got this. I've worked hard many days in my life. And it's just for two or three days. And I'll never forget that more we got out there. And I was fired up. And I was charged up. And I was excited. And we got up on the roof. And we began tearing shingles off. Anybody ever had the joy of tearing off shingles? We tore those shingles off the roof. And we were throwing them in a dumpster. And, and uh, just going through the process of clearing the, the house. And he told me, he said, because North Carolina has a tendency for a storm to just come up out of nowhere, we've got to work fast. And we've got to work hard in case a storm comes up. So we're ripping shingles. And he gave me a, a shovel that I've never seen before. It has little points on the end of it. And you have to slide it underneath the shingles and pull it up. And, and so in those first two or three hours, I thought, man, this is like, I could do this for a living. This, I'm good at this. And this is going great. And we're out there just working ourselves to death. And I remember about four or five hours into that job thinking, I'm getting tired. <laughs> this is really hard. And I began to think, is it quitting time? Is it time for lunch? And, and, and Mike just said, come on, Pastor, we've got to keep, gotta keep working. We've got to keep going. And I'll never forget about 6 o'clock on that first night, walking into my little house there and literally just collapsing on the floor in the living room and thinking, what in the world have I got myself into? Uh, you know what it was? I was beat down with weariness. Um, Paul and his team had labored. That they had exerted themselves to the point that they had literally worn themselves out for the Thessalonians. In fact, I want you to notice what he says in the verse there. He says, laboring, note this, night and day. Because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. Now, I don't know if you knew this, maybe this will be news to you. But by day, Paul was a teacher of the Word of God. Paul was called into the ministry. This is what... 
Joel, Paul's fire. I believe the thing that Paul loved to do with his life was teach the Word of God. I think Paul loved to, to preach the Gospel and pour into people and disciple people and mentor them into faith. And You know, Paul said, man, I could do this 24 hours a day. I love preaching the Word of God. I love doing the work that God has called me to do. That was Paul's heart work. But by night, Paul's not a teacher. Paul is a tent maker. And you know what this was? This was not his heart work. This was his handiwork. The Bible refers to it as his craft. This was the work that Paul had to do in order to make his ends meet. This was the work that Paul engaged in to provide for the basic necessities of life. MacArthur called it, he said this about Paul's work, that Paul lived on what he earned and what the Philippians sent. In fact, I want you to notice Acts 18 and verse number 3. I'll put it on the screen for you here. The Bible says, And because he, that is Paul, was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation, here it is, they were tent makers. A tent maker, according to Strong's Concordance, was one that made small portable tents of leather or cloth of goat's hair or linen for use of tribe. And this was not easy, an easy job. By day, Paul was a teacher. By night, Paul was a tent maker. Paul described his work ethic in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse number 12 when he talks about laboring, working with his own hands. This was some hard work that Paul was engaged in. He, he tells us a little bit more about it in 1 Thessalonians 2 when he refers to it as travail. You see it there? You remember, brethren, our labor and uh, travail. The, the word travail there speaks of painful or laborious effort. 2 Thessalonians 3.8 says, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail, there it is again, night and day, that we might not be chargeable unto any of you. Labor and travail, it seems to describe here their, their painful and laborious effort that they exerted both physically and spiritually. Paul says, Hey Thessalonians, remember our work. Remember the labor. Remember the travail that we engaged in. We were teachers by day. We were tent makers by night. Why do you think Paul wanted them to remember their, their work? And here's the reason I believe. Not so the Thessalonians would extend sympathy to Paul. Not so they would feel bad and think, oh man, we feel guilty because Paul had to really work and he was worn down and beat down with this labor, this effort. No, I don't think Paul was looking for sympathy or looking uh, for them to feel sorry for him or feel guilty. But I believe Paul wanted them to know about their work because he cared so deeply about these people. So much to the point that he was willing to work hard so that he could minister to them. You know what this literally was? It was a labor of love. Yeah. Oh, Paul says, remember. Remember the labor and the travail. Remember our work. I remember hearing my dad say this so many times. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Paul so loved the Thessalonians that he was willing to sacrifice for them. This team not only showed him, uh, they not only showed how much they cared by their word, but also we see letter B that he said, remember our word. Remember our work, first of all, but remember our word. Notice in verse 9, he says that because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached, what? The gospel of God. Paul's work opened the door for Paul to share the word. While there were false teachers, referred to as charlatans by some, who were taking advantage of the people financially by speaking flattering words, Paul and his team faithfully worked with their hands so that they could gain the confidence of the people. Why? So that he could share the good news of the gospel with these people. I put it this way in, your, in my notes this morning. While the false teachers were in it for prosperity, these men were in it for the people. Paul cared about the people. Paul cared not for the finances, for the prosperity. What he wanted to do was invest in these people. And I want to tell you, the challenge to me in this text is very clear. And here's the question that I walked away with in my time of study this week. And it's this. Do I share that same deep concern for people? A willingness to be selfless. A willingness to... To give up the, the finer things of life so that I might have an opportunity to share the message of salvation through Jesus with others. Paul, by the way, Paul got his chance. You can write down Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. Notice what the Bible says. 
Paul, again, working, laboring with his hands, teaching by day, tent making by night. All the Bible says in Acts 17, 1, Now, when they passed through Abdiphilus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and in three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging, here's Paul's message, that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. There he is, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But look what the Bible says in verse 4, and I love this, and some of them believe. Isn't that a beautiful statement right there? Paul's laboring by, as a teacher by day. Paul's laboring as a tent maker by night. He's burning the candle at both ends. He's given himself. He's burnt. Uh, he's uh, worn down or beat down with, with weariness. And Paul continues. And thankfully the Bible says he has fruit. Some of them believe. And some uh, and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. Can I tell you something? The gospel gets the job done. Mm -hmm. That's why Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Oliver B. Green said, the gospel of the marvelous grace of God, the good news of salvation, is a silver bell ringing out the anthem of God's indescribable love. Oh, uh, David Platt put it like this, the gospel, the good news, that ju the just and gracious Creator of the universe has looked upon the hopelessly sinful men and women, has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to bear His wrath against sin on the cross and to show His power of over sin in the resurrection so that everyone who turns from their sin and themselves and trusts in Jesus as Savior and Lord will be reconciled to God forever. That's the message Paul preached. Paul says, hey, Thessalonians, remember our work. Remember the word that we preached unto you. Follow the progression here, by the way. Paul and his team, they won the confidence of the people by being selfless, by laboring with their hands. They won them to Christ by being faithful in their witness of the gospel of God. But now the discipleship process begins, and Paul asked them to remember our walk. Remember our work. Remember the word that we preached. But now Paul says, remember our walk. Look at verse number 10. And this is a challenging verse. He says, Thessalonians, ye are witnesses, and God also. Now note these three words that he uses right here. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Now think about this. First of all, the Thessalonians were the witnesses. Okay, the word witness means a spectator. They were visually seeing some things with their eyes. What were they seeing? Well, they were seeing the ministry of the Apostle Paul. They were seeing the ministry of Silas and Timothy, the outward actions of Paul. And he says, you are witnesses of that. You saw how hard we worked. You saw when we would get up and preach the gospel unto you. But notice what he says next, and God also. And this is important. Because you know what Paul and Silas and Timothy could have done? They could have lived a life out in front of the people that was faith. They could have convinced the Thessalonians that we're somebody who we're really not. But guess what? The only person who was following the ministry of the Apostle Paul was not the Thessalonians. He says, yes, you were witnesses. You could see with your eyes what we were doing. You could see our ministry. But get this. He says, God is a witness. And here's the thing. God not only sees our ministry, God sees our motives. Amen. God sees beyond the actions. God sees beyond the ministry and He looks down into the heart. He sees the motives that are driving their actions. What type of ministry did the Thessalonians and God witness in Paul and Silas and, and Timothy? I call this, remember, our walk. And you notice he says in the verse, how we behaved ourselves. That's what the word walk essentially means. Our behavior. And I want you to notice what this ministry, number one, it was holy. Now don't miss this, alright? I know, I know God wants to give you something today. I know the enemy would love to distract you. But don't miss this today. Paul says, first of all, you know, and God knows, how we minister, he uses the word, holily. It's simply a word that means to be pious or to be devoutly religious. Track with me on this point right here. 
This was nothing more than the natural fruit of deep spiritual roots. You see, the roots of Paul and Silas and Timothy was their belief in Jesus Christ. That's where they started. That was their salvation. That's where all this began was the root system, what you really couldn't see. They had a firm belief, a firm confidence in Jesus Christ. But the fruit that came from those roots of belief was fruit called holiness. Some people might refer to this as devoutly religious behavior. I put this in my notes. Don't miss this. Some people might refer to it as fanaticism. Listen to this now. Stay with me. Some people might refer to it as fanaticism. Um, may I say this this morning? That while we don't promote religion as the primary thing, religious deeds should be present in the life of the believer. Yeah. Now, I believe in that right there, by the way. Sometimes you'll hear people talking about, you know what, as long as you put your faith in Jesus, you're good and it's all fine. And I agree. That's all we have to do to be saved. But I'm going to tell you something. While we don't, we're not saved by our works, I believe saved people work. Amen. If we've truly been brought to life in Christ, there's going to be some fruit that is born in our life. And that's what we see in the Apostle Paul's life. It was fruit. And, and Silas and Timothy, they had fruit coming out from the roots of belief. And the first thing was a fruit of, of holiness. You know what the Bible says in James chapter 1? And don't miss this, because I think this reiterates and reaffirms the point I'm trying to make here. He said, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, note this, but a, what's the word? Doer. A, a doer of the word. This man shall be blessed in his what? Deed. Oh, in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, bridleth not his own tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God with this. And the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. Oh, but notice this part. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Amen. Are your eyes seeing those verses this morning? You know what that's telling me right there? That as we grow in our faith, as we have the roots of belief deep down in our heart, you know what's going to be coming up out of those, those roots? The fruit of holiness. Oh, a, a heart to help those who are in need. Yes, to visit the fatherless and the widows. To do good for other people and be a witness to those. But to keep yourself unspotted from the world. The fruit of of holiness. Of course, Paul and Silas and Timothy were justified. They were positionally holy before God. Not because of anything that they did, but all because of what Jesus did for them on the cross. He was their salvation. Nothing more, nothing less. But while they were positionally holy, don't miss this part, also they were practically holy. In other words, they were living out their justification for all men to see. We call this sanctification. Now I wonder this morning, can I ask you, I, I'm not trying to condemn you, but can I ask you a convicting question this morning? Can you call on people to remember your walk of holiness? That's pretty convicting to me. Paul said, hey, you remember. You remember how we behaved. You remember our behavior? Our behavior among you was, was that of holiness. That's what Paul said. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, that as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Number two, just, I'm going to speed up here. Paul says, You remember our ministry? You remember our, our walk, our lifestyle, our behavior? It was holy. Number two, it was just. This simply means equitable or proper, as is right, righteous. You know what this is? Just get it, get it like this in your heart. Paul and Silas and Timothy were simply living lives that were in line with the Word of God. While people looked at the lives of Paul and Silas and Timothy, they saw men who were committed to living lives that were in absolute obedience and subjection to the commands of Scripture. Amen. While the world chose to live according to the desires of the flesh, Paul and Silas and Timothy chose to be, listen to this word, peculiar. We don't like that word, do we? Like, oh man, I don't want to be peculiar. I don't want to stick out, Pastor. I don't want to be so different. But can I just tell you, did you know we're called to be peculiar people? Amen. That doesn't mean we you know, have to be weird. It doesn't mean we have to you know, all dress in the same outfit so the world goes, man, there's that group from Haven Baptist. 
But there should be some fruit in our lives that sets us apart from the world. I've heard that. And the Bible tells us this. Look at, look at what it says here in 1 Peter 2.9. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Look what he says. A peculiar to his marvelous Amen. Amen. Oh man, there was something different about Paul. What was it? They had a holy ministry. They had a just ministry. But number three, they had an unblameable ministry. Isn't that interesting? Look what the Bible says there. Paul says in verse number nine, you remember, brethren, our, our labor travail. Verse 10, ye are witnesses in God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. To, be, to, be, uh, to behave unblameably literally just means to be faultless or blameless. Um, Strong's put it like this. I didn't put it on the screen, but I like the way he put it. So that there is no cause for censure or disapproval. We've heard in recent days about politicians who are censuring each other. Essentially what they're doing is making a public declaration that I don't think what they're doing is approved. It, 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 it's dis, disapproved by me. I don't think it's right. And Paul says to him, he says, we never did anything, which is a powerful testimony. He says, we never did anything for you to go, I don't think that's right. Man, what a testimony. Amen. And you know, I thought about this, Matt. We say that we are Christians. The word Christian means Christ-like. But you know what the Bible says about Christ? He did no sin. Well, that's pretty clear, right? No. Now, you say, Pastor, we can't live sinless. Yeah, you're right. Well, you know what we can do? We can sin less. Yeah. Oh, we, we may not be able to be sinless, but we can, we can sin less. I'm going to take a moment to read a quote for you from Charles Spurgeon that I think we need today. And it's a long quote, but so stay with it. He says, My brethren, let me say, be ye like Christ at all times. Imitate Him in public. Most of us live in some sort of publicity. Many of us are called to work before our fellow men every day. We are watched. Our words are called. Our lives are examined. Taken to pieces. The eagle-eyed, argus-eyed world observes everything we do. And sharp critics are upon us. Let us live the life of Christ in public. Let us take care that we exhibit our Master and not ourselves. So that we can say, It is no longer that I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Take heed that you carry this into the church too. Be like Christ in the church. How many there are of you seeking preeminence? How many are trying to have some dignity and power over their fellow Christians? Instead of remembering that it is the fundamental rule of all of our churches that all men are equal. Alike, brethren, alike to be received as such, carry out the Spirit of Christ then in your churches. He says, wherever you are, let your fellow members say of you, He has been with Jesus. Isn't that powerful? Sure, we're going to make mistakes. There will be times when we need to offer restoration to the fallen. But as Hebrews 10, 22-25 says, can I give this challenge to our church today? Let us then, uh, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promise. And let us consider one another uh, to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Paul says, hey, i got some things I want you to remember. What do you want us to remember, Paul? Remember our word. Paul, uh, Paul says, I want you to remember our word. But I want you to remember our walk. Now, in my study this week, I just kind of sat back and go, I wonder why. Why did Paul want them to remember that? Why was he calling these things to their memory? And I think here's the answer to the question. Because Paul wanted them to be mindful of the example that they had set and then followed. And that's important. Amen. You know why Paul wanted them to remember his ministry? To remember that they had a holy, just, and unblameable life of behavior is because Paul was calling them into that same lifestyle. And that leads us to number two, which is a challenge to righteousness. Okay? The call to remember, but we see the challenge or a challenge to righteousness. How many of you have ever been challenged to do something? Anybody ever said, you know, like, I, I double dog dare you to do that? <laughs> been challenged to do something and you're like, oh, I can't resist that. How can I resist that double dog there? 
Well, the word challenge simply means, and don't miss this because I think this is really good. The word challenge means a call to take part in. Uh, Paul is inviting the Thessalonians into the same lifestyle that he was living. Paul is saying, this, you remember. Don't you remember? Use your mind and refresh your memory and think back to the way we treated you and the way you live, uh, uh, the way we lived rather, in front of you when we were in Thessalonica. Remember that? That's how you're supposed to live. You're supposed to follow uh, the example. Paul had accepted this challenge. Paul had patterned this challenge. And now he extends the same challenge of holiness to those new believers in Thessalonica. And I want you to notice the letter A. It was a paternal challenge. Let me explain the word paternal. Uh, the word paternal just simply means of or relating to a father. Okay, And we see that in verse 11. It's on the screen. Paul says, as you know, and, and I hope everybody will get this part. If you tune me out, tune me back in for a minute. This will help you. <laughs> as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you. Notice, as a father doth his children. Okay, Let's, let's Look into this for a moment. Earlier in the text, Paul likens his ministry to, to these baby Christians to a sacrificial, selfless mother. And, and that mother deeply cares for her children. You remember last week we talked about the mom who gives of herself and what does she get in return? Dirty diapers and sleepless nights and sickness and all that. Paul says, I was there for you. I cared for you. I, I, I was concerned. I wanted to be close. But now, it's interesting, Paul uses a whole new analogy. Now he likens his ministry to that of an inspiring, motivating father who, yes, cares for his children, but get this word, who challenges his children. MacArthur calls this the personal touch of a loving father. And I just began to think about this, and I know there will be some exceptions to the rule. But you know, I think in most relationships, like if we think about our parents today, we probably see really two different personalities. We have one of our parents who was very full of care and concern and wanted to be close and take care of us. But then on the other hand, we probably had another one of our parents who was really good at challenging us and pushing us and motivating us to do more in our lives. And I think that's what the, the Apostle Paul lays out here. That you have on the one side, you have this exhibition of concern. On the other side, you see a father who challenges. And here Paul lays out a beautifully balanced three-part paternal challenge. Let me give it to you quickly. You should write these things down. It'll help you. First of all, this paternal challenge was relational. Now this is a, in a spiritual context, but if you're a dad here this morning, I'm going to tell you this right here will be a blessing in your life if you're following this. Notice the first word that he uses in the text is, he says, as a father doth his children, we exhorted you. Uh, the word exhort means to call to one's side. Okay, this is the parent that, this is good, this is the parent that spends time with their children. Don't, don't miss this, this is good, this will help somebody. Uh, this is the time that we spend with our children teaching them and, and training them. Maybe it's the time that we spend with our children not teaching them, not training them, but just spending time with our children. Can I tell you this morning that the most important thing you can give your children is you? We, we work long hours so we can pay for our kids' college and get them a car and all these things. You know our kids want more than college and more than a car, more than a nice house or any of that. You know what they really want? They want those things. I get it. <laughs> but hey, you know what? How many kids have been given a nice car? Have been given the best education? And you know what they long for? Mom and dad. Amen. Like, yeah, this car is great. And I'm thankful that we live in this nice house and we have all these nice things. But you know what I really want more than anything? Just a mom and dad who will be there. Amen. And Paul says, that's who I wanted to be for. I just wanted to have that relational connection with you. Uh, just spending time with you, developing that relationship that we share. But notice this, before Paul ever challenges them, before he ever confronts them, he just spends time with them. It's relational. Number two, it's inspirational. Now, fathers, I'm going to tell you something. This will help you. Today. But also as we minister to people, it will help us in our ministry. It begins with a relationship, but now it trans transfers into this inspiration. Notice he uses the word comfort. Uh, he says, as a father doth his children, we exhorted you, but we, we comforted you. And it's a word that just basically means to encourage. So 
So, God gave me the perfect illustration to use today, yesterday. How many of you, let's see, Mason, are you upstairs? Okay, you heard my daughter right there? I love Mason with all my heart. Honey, I love you. I want you to know that. But she's as hard-headed as I am. <laughs> love you, Mason. Thank you. She's, she's sweet as can be, but she is like me. She can be really hard-headed. Yesterday, uh, Amber and I had a few minutes, and we said, let's go take the kids on a bike ride. And, and we're riding down to the park. And Mason is at that point in her life where she's like, we're taking the training wheels off, and she's getting it. But because she's so thick schooled and hard-headed, hey, I love you, Mason, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, honey. So, but because she's so hard-headed, when she gets frustrated about something, she's like, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. You're not going to make me. That, that's Mason's mentality. But listen, listen now. You know what a father does? A father inspires his children, even when they get to that point of frustration, ready to quit and throw in the towel. And a father leans in and says, hey, you can do this. I believe you. You can make this happen. You can do it. And you know, we kept telling her that yesterday. Hey, you can do this. <coughs> Get back on your bike. Yeah, you fell. Yeah, you skinned your knee. Yeah, you, you messed up. But hey, you know what? Get back up. Get back on the bike. And let's keep riding. It starts with that relationship. Then it goes into that inspiration. But that leads us to the third thing. And that is confrontation. This paternal challenge was relational. It was inspirational. But here comes the, the tough part. It was confrontational. Notice the word that Paul uses. It's the word charged. He says, as a father doth his children, we exhorted you, yes, we comforted you, but we charged you. And it means to be a witness. It means to bear record. And this was Paul's responsibility. To watch how these baby Christians were doing. What, how... Uh, they were living their lives. Listen to this now. But then to offer a loving but challenging critique. And here's the thing. And fathers don't miss this. Because this is a spiritual analogy. But I think it fits right into our fathering as, as parents. Listen to this. Because Paul was relational. Who's tracking with me today? Amen. Uh, because he was inspirational. Now he had the freedom to be confrontational. Amen. You know what happens to me sometimes is I try to be confrontational without being relational and inspirational. You know what that does? That's what the Bible calls a father provoking his children to wrath. You don't have their heart, you don't have their love, and you're just beating them down. And Paul says, hey, I want you to remember something. Remember our ministry? The first thing we did was we just spent time with you. We built, built that relationship. Number two, we inspired you. We wanted you to believe that there was more to come. We wanted you to believe that you could go farther than you ever thought you could. But because of the relationship, because of the inspiration, Paul says, now I have a responsibility to confront you. He told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 2, to reprove, to rebuke, and to exhort. Now I want you to notice letter B. It was a pure challenge. It was a paternal challenge, but it was, it was a pure challenge. And I'm just about finished here. And this is really going to be helpful, I think. Notice what he says in verse 12. So Paul has the relationship. He's inspiring them to believe there's more to come. He is being confrontational. Now he's going to get on them. And here's where the confrontation comes in. Look at verse 12. That ye would, would you read this with me? Walk worthy of God. Oh, walk worthy of God. Paul's going to really put, the, put it on. He's going to challenge them right here. He says, I'm going to challenge you that ye, or I did challenge you, that ye would walk worthy of God. And Paul states here that they, and yes, all believers, including us, have been called unto God's kingdom and God's glory. Let me show this to you very quickly. First of all, he says you were called unto His kingdom. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, I think Ephesians 2 lays it out. Paul says it there like this. Now therefore... Ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. What does it mean to be called into the kingdom of God? Well, I think what Paul was saying here is that in our former state, that is, before salvation, he refers to us and them as strangers and foreigners to the kingdom of God. Strangers and foreigners to the family of God. Of God. I think you can relate to this. How many of you have ever traveled outside the United States? Let me see your hand if you've done that. Okay. Lots of them. Most of them. Mm. You ever been to another country that you're not familiar with? And you go to this country and you're not familiar with their culture. 
You're not familiar with their language. You're not familiar with their cuisine. And you know what you feel like? You feel like a fish out of water. You can't talk to anybody. You don't know how to act. You don't know how to present yourself. You don't know what food is good to eat. You can't even read it, so you don't even know what it is. You know what you are. You're a stranger. You're a foreigner. And Paul said the same could be said about you before you got saved. Don't miss this. Paul says before you got saved, the way Christians lived their lives, what the Bible had to say was all strange. And it was foreign. But then something happened. And you got saved. And those things that used to be strange, those things that used to be weird and foreign and peculiar, you begin to think, you know, I kind of like that. And you begin to adopt and adapt those things into your life as a believer. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things uh, have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's an old song that we used to sing with our kids. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The places I used to go, I don't go to them anymore. The things I used to watch, I don't watch them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. Amen. Hey, you know, we're not a part of the kingdom of this world anymore. Did you know that? Amen. If you've been saved, yeah. it's not normal anymore for us to do the things that we used to do. We are foreigners and strangers in this world. Uh, sometimes we say we are pilgrims just passing through. In this world, we begin to think, man, those things that I used to do, they're not as comfortable anymore. I don't enjoy them as much as I used to. I don't love those things that I used to love. That's the way it should be. Why? Because in the kingdom of God, there's a culture of holiness. Amen. That's what Paul says. Paul says, You've been called under the kingdom of God. You've been called, next of all, called under the glory of God. <clears throat> Ephesians 1.12 That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. You know what the glory of God is? Very simply, the, the glory of God is the sum total of who He is. Before salvation, you know what? We had our own individual aspirations. Probably most have a desire to make a name for themselves, as I mentioned with Brother Fry a moment ago, or maybe they have a desire to leave a personal legacy. But, but now, we've not been called to make a name for ourselves. We've been called to share the fame of Jesus with the world. Mm -hmm. And it's no longer about me, and it's no longer about you. It's about one name, and His name is Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. Amen. Amen. And everything we do is to be for His glory. This is our calling, friends. Hey, listen, walking worthy is not a choice that you can either choose to to do or not do. Walking worthy is your calling as a believer in Christ. You and I have been called unto His kingdom. We have been called unto His glory to share the name of Jesus. It's all about Him. And this is the heart behind living holy. We live lives that are peculiar, not so the world can look at me and go, wow, that guy's awesome. The world looks at me living a unique, peculiar lifestyle and goes, man, His God is pretty awesome. Amen. That's what it's about. That's why Paul challenged a lot of the churches. He said to the Ephesians, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. He told the Colossians, walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. And that's my challenge to the church at Haven Baptist today. Walk worthy of your calling. You've been called into the kingdom of God. You've been called for the glory of God. And the question this morning is this, are you walking worthy of that calling? I'm going to use this illustration. I'm going to quit. I'm going to be done. You know we go to Disney World sometimes, Disneyland, you guys have been there, right? <laughs> we go to Disney World or Disneyland or do anything related to Disney, you know, we, we kind of raise our expectations a little bit. We, we're even willing to pay a little bit more, you know, to go to Disneyland than we would to go to Magic Mountain or, or something. Why? Because there's something different about Disneyland. I mean, Magic Mountain's great, don't get me wrong, but you kind of know what to expect when you go to Magic Mountain. But when you go to Disney World, you know what you expect? I wrote down a few things that I expect when I pay that money to go uh, to Disney World. I expect excellence. I expect cleanliness. Or cleanliness, how are you going to say that? Uh, I expect friendliness. I expect them to take everything to the next level. You know why? Because that's the culture of Disney. That's what their employees are called into. Who's traveling with this? And so we hold them to that high level. And say, you know what, you're a Disney employee, you're a cast member with Disney, and you're supposed to be excellent and clean and, and friendly. And you know what happens is when we come into contact with a, a cast member who's not excellent, who's not clean, who's not friendly, who's just plain rude, you know what, we get bent out of shape and go, you're a Disney employee. 
I expect more out of you than that. And can I tell you this morning? We have been called not to be Disney employees. We've been called to the kingdom of God. Amen. We've been called for the glory of God. Sir. And Finnis Dake referred to this as the highest calling of all. And the world has lived in such a way now that the world doesn't even expect the church to be any different. You know what that is? That's a shame to the name of our Savior. Mm -hmm. Hey, we are called to live a holy life. And last of all, we see that it was a performed challenge. I'm done with this. Paul says, you remember all that. But look at verse 13. He says, and I love this, for this cause also... Thank we God without ceasing. Paul says, I can't stop thanking God for what I'm about to tell you. And I love this. He says, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Notice that we see the word received two times. I've got it in bold and on the screen here. We see the word received two separate times. Uh, one commentary, the Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary said the Greek for the first received implies simply the hearing of it. The Greek for the second is accepted or welcomed. But here's the thing I want you to notice. How did they receive this challenge from Paul? Well, that's the thing. They didn't receive it as if it was coming from Paul. Did you miss what I just said? Let me back up and say it again. How did they receive this calling, this challenge? Well, that's the thing. They didn't receive the challenge as, as if it was coming from Paul. In fact, look what he says in the verse there. He, he says, When ye received the word which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God Amen. which ye heard of us. You know what I'm telling you today? I'm calling you into a lifestyle of holiness, but I'm going to tell you something. If all you do, don't miss this, if all you do is hear the words coming from Zach, you're going to walk out that door and within five minutes it's going to be gone. You know why? Because it's my word. And, and Matthew Henry said about the words of men that they are frail and perishing like themselves, sometimes false, thick, fickle and foolish, but here's the change, but God's word is holy, Amen. wise, just and faithful. Let us receive it and regard it accordingly. And what happened when they received the Word, not from Paul, but the Word from God to walk worthy? Well, we see what they did in, in verse number 13 there when Paul says, you, you received the Word of God, which, here it is, effectually worketh also in you that believe. So now it wasn't just Paul's ministry. It wasn't just Paul and Silas and Timothy living holy and just and unblameable. But guess what? The Thessalonians started living holy and just and unblameable. It was effectually working in them. And I'm going to close with this quote from Matthew Henry that we started with. Our great gospel privilege is that God has called us to His kingdom and glory. The great gospel duty is that we walk worthy of God. We should live as become those called with such a high and holy calling. Our great business is to honor, serve, and please God and to seek to be worthy of Him. Let's bow our heads this morning. And let's respond to this message today. Can I just ask you a question? I'm just going to tell you, I feel conviction on this. Are you walking worthy of God? Because I'm going to tell you right now, if we're not living lives that are holy and just and blameless, God's not pleased. So I just wonder, and I, I sense the presence of God in this moment. What is it in your life right now that God's not pleased with? You talked about that Disney culture, you know? Clean, and friendly, and excellent. Man, that can mix my heart today. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to accept this challenge. Not because it came from Pastor Zach, but because it came from a holy God. We've been called into your kingdom. We've been called into your glory. Help us to live like it. Oh God, we need your help. We need your Holy Spirit to create us in Christ Jesus to transform us into the image of your Son. I pray you'll do a, a lasting work, a transformational work in our hearts today. 
I believe there are some people here under the sound of my voice, Lord, you know the hearts, maybe that have some things right now in their lives that are not pleasing to you. And it's my hope and prayer that you'll convict them and draw them to Christ and help them to get rid of those things and say, Lord, I, I want to live peculiar. I want to live right. I want to live holy and just and unblameable by your grace and for your glory. I want to be that peculiar person that you've called me to be. Help us, Father. If there might be one today that is lost without Christ, I pray you would draw them to Christ, help them to know that they're a sinner, that Jesus is their Savior. And I pray your will will be done. Help us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Before we stand, before we sing, with every head bowed and every eye closed, who would say, Pastor, that message really spoke to my heart today. And I'd like to ask you to pray for me. Nobody's looking around. Who would say, Pastor, that message spoke to me. I'm going to lift my hand and ask for your prayer. I see hands all around. Good, good. Hands all around. Put your hands down. So now is the time to respond. Now is when we act upon the message that we've been confronted with. So Father, help us, we pray. Speak to hearts. Give us the strength to make decisions that will be helpful to be more like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. Let's sing this song together. Only a home of God.
us to walk worthy of you. God, help us to remember that we're strangers and we're foreigners in this world. We've been called into your kingdom and called into your glory. Help us to walk worthy of that. I pray your will will be done. I pray your Holy Spirit will continue to minister to us as we walk away there. Challenge us, we pray. In Jesus' name.